How would you treat this patient? Look at the resorption in the lower arch, similar resorption in the maxillary arch. This is a 70-year-old patient who has worn a denture or dentures for at least 50 years. Be problematic placing a lot of implants in the posterior area, but she does have an area of bone in the mandibular anterior, which we may could use to place a single implant. She refers to this area as a golf ball when she takes her denture out. So, the patient we're dealing with is a 70-year-old Caucasian female. As I said earlier, she's worn a denture or dentures for nearly 50 years. And interestingly enough, at 70 years old, she is only allowed to work 20 hours a week at a minimum wage in a grocery store where she works in the deli section making sandwiches, salads, and so forth. Yes, she has her social security, but is she going to be able to pay for extensive dental work? And more and more patients are falling into this category for an all-on-four case, an arch, maybe, whatever. Her chief complaint is my dentures won't stay in. I'm hoping a new set will fit better. What we're going to perform on this patient is called, or I refer to as a vestibular deepening and a single dental implant. We're hoping for economic purposes that we can get enough retention with a single tooth implant to make this a significant improvement in her life. This is an alternative to an all on four perhaps. Well, we may refer to this as age-appropriate dentistry, given that she's 70 years old. And also, it may refer to as financially appropriate dentistry to a lady who is in basically a hopeless situation with minimal finances. Here we see the ridges. And with a periodontal probe, you can see that she has 7 millimeters vestibular depth in the maxillary arch and only 5 millimeters in the mandibular arch. Certainly, this is going to be a challenge if we're going to have nice fitting dentures. These are the dentures that she's currently wearing. She refers to these, or I refer to these, as her Sunday dentures. She wears them when she's working. She wears them when she goes to church on Sunday. However, on the lower right, we can see her smile in the way she has to purse her lips to hold these dentures in when she speaks, a very unpleasant situation. The first step is to lengthen the flange on this denture using triad material. Before placing the triad material, the denture is roughened and bonding material to enhance the attachment of the triad material is bonded. Here we're now adding the triad material which in a soft form will be placed in the mouth and some border molding done before final curing. Following the final curing, the denture is then finished and polished as you would any other denture. And this is the stent denture or the treatment denture with the bonding material lengthening the flange, in this case, about five millimeters. So what we're going to do here is go back in the literature 50 years and look at a technique that was described by Herman Korn, uh, not in this situation, but we'll discuss that in a minute. This is his periosteal separation with fenestration down to bone. This was originally used in the mandibular anterior to deepen the vestibule. And you can see on this central incisor that there is some recession there's a questionable amount of keratinized tissue, and the question is, do you graft this or do you do perhaps a simpler procedure? So what you can do in this particular case is Korn's uh, periosteal separation with fenestration. This is the way the procedure's done. We see on the mandibular right, a close-up now, that the first incision is made at the mucogingival junction, and then a split thickness incision is made leaving periosteum down about five to six millimeters 
finely exposing bone in the apical area. And where bone is exposed, we will get a white scar forming there, and that will be the depth of the new vestibule. This lower incisor is going to be retracted orthodontically, which means that the quality of the tissue on the facial is going to thicken and rise and perhaps negate the need for a, any type of graft. Now we see on the lower right the way the scar is beginning to form down here, and this is about a two or three week post-op. So this is the procedure that we're going to do in the maxillary arch to deepen the vestibule to get a better fitting maxillary denture. So the formation of the apical scar will be the depth of the new vestibule. The split thickness incision is made at the mucogingival junction. And then once you go five, six millimeters apical to that, then you can use the Bard Parker to go ahead and cut through the periosteum exposing bone, then take a periosteal elevator to elevate the tissue exposing a band of bone, which on final healing will form the white scar that we've talked about and this will be the depth of the new vestibule. The surgery is basically complete here. Uh, it goes from hamular notch to hamular notch, and this is now ready to try in the denture almost. But what we want to do is to go in the maxillary uh, nasal spine area, and here we're using a, a diamond uh, burr uh, to do an uh, osteoplasty to remove the nasal spine, so we can actually deepen the vestibule in that area as well. We're now trying in the denture, and you'll see on the lower right, the denture will fit, and if necessary, you can go do some touch-up surgery in an area where it might be binding. But remember, as we said earlier, we're gonna go from hamular notch to hamular notch. On the left, we see the treatment denture, or a stent, as we said earlier. And to assure a little better fit with this, we're going to use a soft liner. And in this case, we're using CoSoft, which you're familiar with. It's now being tried in, and the denture has a certain amount of suction. And the patient already begins to sense uh, what we're able to accomplish. We go ahead and finish that down, and the yellow arrow here points to where the nasal spine was removed, and you can see the different contour that we have here. And obviously the flange goes much further up, adding to the retention of the denture. And here it is in place. No longer a Sunday denture, she can actually do some functioning with this denture. The vestibular depth, as I said earlier, has been increased from 7 millimeters to 12 millimeters. Here we see a three-week post-op, and you can see some excessive redundant tissue at the depth of the vestibule. We let it heal for another three weeks, and here you see, we see this tissue has not completely resorbed. So therefore, we're going to use a radiosurgery unit to remove that excessive tissue. Radio surgery may be a term that you're not familiar with, and it is a, uh, an alternative to the dental laser or to electrosurgery. And uh, let's discuss a little bit about this. This is a very brief description, and if you'll go later on this web textbook, you will find a section on the clinical use of radio surgery, which uh, you will find to be quite interesting. This is completely different in concept from electrocautery or electrosurgery. Electrosurgery uses a lower frequency, therefore you have deeper penetration, generates significant heat, and therefore you have significant tissue destruction. Radiosurgery, on the other hand, creates more of a laser-like wound and heals more like a laser-like wound. The biggest thing I like about it is you have a greater tactile sense and control than you have with a laser. This has a higher frequency, shallower penetration, minimal heat, and minimal tissue destruction, and heals, as I said, like a laser wound. The Dental Surge 90 unit came on the market in the late 1960s, and it was developed by Dr. Elman. There are two ports on the bottom of this unit. In the first port, goes the cord which is going to attach to the antenna. 
and the second pour is the cord that leads to the cutting tip. What I like about this unit, it has multiple settings on it. You can see we have a fully filtered cut on the left, which is the one we mainly use. And it's 90% cutting and only 10% coagulation. The next setting is the cutting mode, and this is 50% cutting and 50% coagulation. This has very limited use in periodontal surgery, in my opinion. If you get an area that is oozing and bleeding a little bit, like if, if you were doing a free gingival graft, you may want to use this to touch the palate where the area is bleeding. The final setting on here is the one that says coagulation, and that's only 10% cutting and 90% coagulation. Below the cutting mode, you will see a dial 1 through 10. You can even modify the energy level with this dial, which allows you to use more or less energy and get much more precise cutting. A close-up view of that dial shows a setting of four. This is typically where I start, and you will see in the video on the clinical use how we determine what to set this on. The antenna is placed behind the head as close to the surgical site as possible. The antenna's function is to, again, to refine the energy level that's going to the surgical site. The closer the antenna is to the surgical site, the less energy is used. By placing the antenna as close as possible to the radio surgery site, we reduce the coagulation. This coupled with the dial that we mentioned on the slide before makes for some very precise cutting. We now see the maxillary arch about four weeks after surgery and the arrows point to redundant tissue. This is where the radio surgery is at its best. You can see one of the electrode tips on the lower left and on the lower right you can see how the tissue has been obliterated and please note there is absolutely no bleeding. Healing is now complete and we can see the white scar that I had mentioned earlier. The original mucogingival junction depth of the vestibule was 7 millimeters, but we've increased this by 5 millimeters, so the new vestibular depth is 12 millimeters. You will also note that in the nasal spine area, we have gotten more retention there because we've increased the vestibular depth as well. What we've accomplished here is we have improved the retention, we've improved the facial contours, we've eliminated wrinkles, we have a much happier patient, and because of the retention of the denture, the function is very much better, and you will hear her testimony at the end of this presentation. So here's our original ridges, the original ridges, and on the right we see the maxillary ridge that we just discussed. At this point, it's been eight weeks since we did the original surgery, and so a, a reline is indicated here using, again, the co-liner. And it's placed in, and this gives the patient even a little more retention. Here is contact information should you want to order the dental surge unit or any other of the Elman products. We're now ready to perform the second surgery which is going to be a graft in the mandibular anterior area to enhance the keratinized tissue. Here we're seeing the golf ball that she talked about. And what we're going to do is to use an envelope flap, expose the area, again doing some osseous surgery, osteoplasty, to flatten this area to create a broader base to place the implant. Perhaps two implants could be placed in this area, which would be more ideal. However, financially, we had discussed with her a possible single implant, and she had chosen to go with just a single implant rather than two. In this case, we use mucograft as our grafting material. On the lower left, you can see the material, and on the lower right, you can see after it has been 
soaked and softened to make the material more malleable. The graft is being placed and on the lower right you can see the suturing. The third surgery is going to be the implant placement and this is going to be fairly routine to those of you that place implants. This is a CBT scan of the implant that we plan to put in. We're going to put in an 8 millimeter implant, another scan, and we're now ready to do the surgery using an envelope flap and again as we did in the previous uh, keratinized tissue surgery we're not going to use any vertical incisions. The implant now is being placed and now what I want you to see and note on the lower right is that we did not do immediate insertion and there's a reason for this that we will discuss in a few minutes. So here's the implant in place and a scan on that. And this I think is a very significant slide. The prosthodontist used a short abutment in an attempt to reduce the lateral stresses on this implant. But specifically what I want you to see, this is the new mucogingival junction and I'm a firm believer that implants have a better prognosis if they're surrounded by keratinized tissue, which this implant does have. So here we see a simulated scan, an actual scan, again simulated and again actual. Now the question now comes to load or not to load. Now let's go to the literature. Here's an article published in December of 2016. In this article there were 158 patients treated and they received a single implant. Half of the patients were immediately loaded whereas the other half were not loaded and uncovered and loaded in three months. The delayed healing group experienced less discomfort and there was no sign of periimplantitis. In the second study published in January, February of 2017, the authors included in the study 117 patients and these patients were evaluated five years after implant placement. All the implants were immediately loaded. That's very significant. All the failures occurred in the first year after placement and after that first year between years two and five, interestingly enough, there were no implant failures. Only minimal maintenance was required, as in the first study, and there were also, as in the first study, there were no signs of peri-implantitis. So the question, to load or not to load, the answer, in my opinion, is do not load for at least three months. This was the treatment denture, and this was the final denture. Yes, there was a little relapse in the posterior area. Perhaps we did not go as far apically as we wanted to, but this is, uh, this is the new denture, and notice the size of the teeth as well. The lower denture with the attachment for the implant to go into place, and the maxillary denture. Now we see on the top left the original smile where she pursed her lips so that she could, could talk but really could not smile. And on the lower right is we see her smile after the implant is in place and the new modified denture in place. You will notice there are fewer wrinkles. Psychologically, she is a lot happier and certainly has a more youthful look. Now, let's hear what our patient has to say about what we've been able to accomplish with these procedures. And I'm, um, I'm so confident in this denture and the stability of it. I'm going to try to eat some nuts, which are I haven't been able to eat for years. And it's easy to do. I can, I can eat the nuts. And my denture isn't even moving. And the, the way they... The way they made the denture, the food particles don't go underneath of it. 
So I'm very pleased. I'm very happy. I'd like to thank the people who worked hard on this case, Dr. Gabriel Ingram, who was the prosthodontist in charge of the case, as well as the chief resident in periodontics at the time, uh, Jennifer Bolin. Hopefully, viewing this video will give you an idea of something that can be done on an extremely compromised patient. We've heard how functional this denture and implant denture are. We've seen the impact on her face with the wrinkles removed. We've seen she can now smile. And certainly, in hearing the video, you can see how functional this is. Are there any questions?